Hello, and welcome to the Narc Matter Knits podcast, episode two. Um, today we're going to, as I, as I mentioned in the first episode of my podcast, uh, each of my episodes is going to have a theme for the week. And, uh, and the first episode had focused on the theme of beginnings, appropriately. Today we're going to talk about, I was originally going to call it setting the twist, which is a term from spinning. And I realized in looking into it more that I was kind of misusing that term. What I really wanted to talk about is, is more what's called resting singles in spinning. And I'll explain what that means in a second. Um, but kind of the, the basic idea of when has a project been marinating long enough? And why does it make us feel guilty when it's been resting too long? Those whips that unfinished objects, UFOs that that just kind of languish and um, and start to weigh on us, sometimes quite literally. <laughs> and when is it just a good idea to kind of let a project sit for a while because it just needs it needs some time to itself? So let me show you the thing that kind of inspired this this whole idea in the first place. It's a uh, spinning project that is actually kind of my first major spinning project. I learned how to spin at, um, I had this amazing opportunity to take a, a week-long spinning and uh, natural dyeing class at the uh, John C. Campbell Folk School in Western North Carolina, that little western tip of the state. Uh, it's an amazing place. And the woman who teaches the, uh, the spinning and dyeing classes there, a woman named Martha, is um, is an excellent teacher and um, so I learned how to spin there and got a wheel was really hooked on it and um, and when I ordered the wheel which I have a, a Kromsky minstrel because I really like the the castle style uh, double treadle sort of wheels they just I'm, I'm a pretty tall person so for whatever reason those just kind of fit my uh, body shape better and um, when I ordered the wheel, for reasons that I can no longer explain, I really don't understand why I did this, I ordered a pound, an entire pound of undyed, I don't even know what it is. I have no idea. It's wool. It comes from a sheep of some kind. Uh, and it's it's lovely. It's, it's actually a nice first yarn to to spin. I'm going to hold it back here so the color's a little, yeah, it's more like the color. It's kind of an oatmeal sort of color. Um, it is taking me forever to spin this because I'm a new spinner. I mean, you can kind of see it. See how in the, let me see if I can get a good spot here. Yeah, here's a spot. You can see how I've over twisted it in spots so that it's just kind of kinked up on itself. Um, and it's also spinning very thin, which I know is, you know, kind of a nice thing, but it just means it's taking forever. I'll show you. See, I'm trying to find a little single ply of it so I can show you. It's, you know, it's actually quite, at least for a beginner spinner, quite fine. Um, so, sorry about my finger. It's so dry here that that my skin actually split open. How gross is that? I'm going to see if I can come up with a new gross thing every week for you. Last week it was wiping my nose, this week it's my bloody finger. Anyways, <laughs> so here's one bobbin of this. Oh, but there's more. Uh, the bobbin that I was recently, well, recently working on, and then there's this that I had to wind off because I would have ran out of bobbins. And there's this. There's this. And I think that's it what I've spun so far, but I'm not even, I think maybe I'm halfway done. I've still got all of this. Right? No, I can't even see. There's tons of it still left. I mean, that's probably maybe not half a pound, but it's, it's pretty close. So what happened was, uh, this just kind of, I stopped spinning for like, a year, maybe more, maybe a year and a half, because this was boring the crap out of me. I just couldn't bring myself to go back and spin it. But I have, you know, one of those weird uh, fixations that, you know, once I start something, I've got to finish it, you know, or at least I used to. I think I've kind of 
moved past that a little bit. I, I no longer feel like I have to finish a book that I started. If I don't like it, I will just stop reading it. Um, and I think I've come to the same place with this spinning. I do like it. It's just kind of boring. And I need to do something different for a little while. So I finally, a couple of weeks ago, pulled, you know, wound this off of my third bobbin. I have three bobbins that came with my wheel originally. Finally wound this off and started spinning something else. And it's so nice to to be spinning again. Um, and I'll show you what I what I started spinning. I had to pick something really colorful. I don't have a lot of fleece. Uh, but I, a number of years ago, probably, I don't know, maybe five years ago, at a, at a fiber festival, bought this lovely, um, this lovely stuff. I've pulled it apart into, we kind of started pre-drafting it a little bit. Um, that's why it's all in these little snakes. It was originally in this nice little braid. Um, but this is, I was so amused when I pulled this out and realized what it was. I bought this at Fiber College, a, uh, a really nice little fiber festival slash um, a place where you take, can take classes. It's on a campground in Searsport, Maine, um, run by this wonderful woman, Astrid Tangway. And I really would like to go back at some point. I, I taught there at um, about five years ago and at the one of the vendors um, picked this up and was so amused when I pulled the card out and realized that it's my Highland Handmaids, one of my favorite podcasts. And you know, years ago, before I had any idea who she was, I bought some of her fiber. And it's, uh, you probably can't see the, because my camera tends to wash things out, you probably can't see what it is. It's called, um, well, the colorway is called Vintage, and um, and it's 100% superwash blue-faced Lester, which by all accounts is another good um, beginner spinning fiber. And this is four ounces. I think I can handle four ounces. So I've been spinning that and I'm not a good enough spinner to really have much control over the way I spin, but it's, it's spinning not quite as fine as this other stuff. And I do, I don't know, some weird kind of thing. It's not quite inchworm. Um, so I'm not really getting a, a true worsted. I have more of a kind of somewhere between a medium draw and an inchworm. So it's it's probably some weird hybrid that between woolen and worsted spinning. But um, but it's coming out nicely, and I'm just kind of getting used to my wheel again. Boy, I had to dust and oil the bejesus out of that thing to get it working again. And actually, there was a screw that had fallen off from somewhere, and I had to figure out where it went. <laughs> you know, kind of embarrassing. Um, so yeah, I mean, I kind of, I realized that, you know, one of the things that I just need to kind of make sure to do with my spinning and kind of with my fiber work in general is just to realize that there are times when it's okay for a project to just kind of sit aside for a little while. Um, these singles needed to rest. And I realize as I'm talking about this, I need to explain kind of the now explain the whole concept of these resting singles. When when you're spinning, um, one of the things that you're supposed to do after you've spun the singles, so a single ply is called a singles. After you've spun one of these, um, spun it up into a onto a bobbin, um, you're told not to ply these immediately. That you need to kind of let the singles rest either on the bobbin or elsewhere for a little while, uh, at least 24 hours. And what this is supposed to do is kind of let the energy in the yarn even out. So if you've overplied it, if you've put too much twist in, um, or if you've unevenly plied it, it will allow the yarn to relax a little bit, or the, the single, the ply to yarn to relax a little bit. And um, and I was reading about this recently, and I just thought it was so funny when I was thinking about this. I mean, this has been sitting on this bobbin, I think this was the first bobbin that I spun of this yarn. It's This has been sitting on the bobbin for five years. <laughs> I think it's been resting long enough. In fact, I think there's probably a statute of limitations on how much rest is too much rest. Uh, probably a lot of the energy has gone out of this. And I I understand that if you let it rest too long and then ply it up and wash it, that some of that 
twist will actually kind of pop back into the into the yarn again. Here's hoping. It's going to be interesting to see what this does when I finally, you know, sometime in my 50s get to applying this. Um, but it just got me thinking about uh, how in other areas of my fiber life, not just in spinning, um, things kind of tend to drift by the wayside. Projects tend to go to the back of the drawer and the bottom of the bag and the back of the closet. And, um, and what I'm supposed to do about them. You know, when is it time to frog it? When is it time to let something go? And, um, and why do things just kind of rest for so long? Um, so let me show you, show you another example of this. This is a, a project that I've been working on, again, for years. I mean, well, I haven't been working on it. That's kind of my whole point. This is a, a stole. Let me see. I'll go back a little bit. You can kind of see the whole thing. It's a shawl that, um, that I've been working on for my mom. And she watches this, so this is going to completely ruin it. So ruin the surprise for her, but I think by now... <laughs> Well, someday I will finish this, and maybe, the, you know, her seeing this will prompt me to do it. Uh, but basically the idea was that my mom has wanted me to knit her a shawl for a long time, and I, and I want to do it. Um, she knits herself. She's the one who taught me how to knit. But she would just like me to, she wants me to make her something. So, um, or she really especially wants a shawl. And she loves dogwood trees. So what I was trying to, what I'm trying to do here is to come up with kind of a dogwood shawl. So it'll just be a long, you know, maybe 60 inch rectangular stole. And it's all in this kind of classic leaf lace sort of motif. So that's sort of the, the foliage in the background. And then what I want to do with it once I've, once I've knit up the length of it is to weave some of this stuff, this really cool habu, um, what is it? Sumagi silk combination. It's like a silk, I guess it's all silk. Um, but basically, you see how it kind of looks woody? Um, those are going to be, I'm going to weave that into, let's see if I can show you here, into those lines of yarn overs, kind of weave them in and out of there to look like branches going up and down the shawl. And then make wee little flowers out of, boy, that's washed out, out of these. This is um, RYC Luxury Cotton DK. It's from Rowan. It's a cotton viscose silk blend. Um, and I'll just make little dogwood flowers out of that. So it'll be very pretty once it's once it's done. Oh, and the flowers will just go on one end, so they'll be kind of um, kind of cascade down the bottom and you know kind of fill out the one bottom corner of it. So they won't be all over the shawl. But I think it'll be really pretty. It just you know what's happening is that this these are size threes, and it's a sixty inch shawl of this leaf lace, it's just taking, it's just taking forever. Um, it's fun to work on. It's, that's not the problem. It's just other projects come up. It's not the kind of thing that you can just sit down and finish, or at least I can't. Um, so it just kind of keeps drifting to the wayside. And that used to just kind of weigh on me. But again, I just kept thinking, I started thinking, you know, it's okay. <laughs> People feel such guilt about works in progress and unfinished objects. And um, I, the more, the more I, the longer that I knit, the more I just feel like it is perfectly fine for projects to rest to the side for a while, and um, and they don't necessarily lose their energy in the process. They can be, it can be rejuvenating to pull them back out and work on them again. Um, you know, it's a little like finding something in, in the back of your closet that you forgot you had and that you, you know, you really like to wear. So I don't think, I mean, I, I think that's kind of one of my takeaway lessons from today is just that, um, that works in progress are not a bad thing. They don't have to be a source of guilt. Um, even when they're associated with your mom. <laughs> 
Now, there are there are works in progress that I do feel guilty about, uh, guilty about not working on. And here is one of them. Look, see how far I've gotten? I caked it. <laughs> no, I've actually swatched this, which is why the ball is a little small. Um, this is an Anzula yarn. And it is, uh, here, here's the, here's another color of it. And it's actually in the, oh, why are you so washed out? There we go. It's Anzula for better or for worsted, which is a 80% superwash, 10% cashmere, 10% nylon. So what's often called an MCN base. This is the periwinkle color. And I forget what their actual name for this is, but it's this gorgeous mushroom kind of color. Um, the camera's not quite doing it justice. It's got a little bit more blue in it, or blue undertones than this is picking up. Uh, just a very rich, complex neutral. I'm not usually a neutral sort of person, but I really, really like this. This is what grabbed me. Now, the story behind this, these yarns, and Zulu for better or for worsted, is that um, I went, uh, for the last couple of years, I've gone to the National Needle Arts Association meeting in June, TNNA. And that is basically the, the kind of trade show for the fiber industry. And mostly I was going to work at the Cooperative Press booth, the, the uh, independent publisher that I work for. Um, but I also had some time to walk around as a designer. And, you know, what mainly goes on at this show is that yarn stores come to order yarn for their stores for the coming season. And the big show is in June so that they can order for the fall, right? Um, but designers also walk around and, um, you know, a lot of the yarn companies are really nice about having some samples of yarn that designers can take home either to swatch with, or sometimes they'll even give you enough to work up a project if you've got something specific in mind. So I really wanted to do a sweater in this yarn. I still do. And, um, and it's just, I, I've been trying to figure out what, what is it that is stymieing me about this yarn and um and i think what's you know one of the big issues is that i really want to do it justice you know it's one of those yarns that and i know you can sympathize with this that where it just kind of sits in your stash and it's and it, you just think it's so pretty that it's hard to think of what to do with it um, so I, I, you know, I sort of feel tugged in two directions with this yarn. On the one hand, it's so pretty that I almost can't knit it. And on the other hand, they gave me a, a sweater's worth of yarn. <laughs> I need to knit it up into a sample and into a pattern and, you know, get it out there. Uh, I have an idea in mind. I've swatched it. I've, I've actually even started writing up the pattern. It's just a matter of, you know, setting it aside the time to, um, to get it done. So that will that will be coming up soon. Um, one last example I want to show you of things that you know perhaps marinate too long. There are just too many things to work on, aren't there? <sighs> really, that's ultimately what we're talking about here. Okay, so this. This is a sweater that I designed for a British knitting magazine that shall remain nameless. It is now defunct and out of business. Um, it's a lovely, well here, let me show you a, a picture of the actual garment. Um, let's see if I can find a picture that doesn't, uh, there we go. Okay, so I'm showing it to you in black and white because um, well, partly because that's the, I, I photocopied it so I could make notes all over the page. Um, so I designed this sweater for the, the magazine, um, knitted up in the yarn they chose for me, which this is why I'm re-knitting it. Um, it just wasn't to my taste. They chose this bubblegum pink for the, um, for the main color. And then for the, uh, for the, the collar and the belt and the cuffs, which are in a contrasting bulky weight yarn, they chose this rainbow colored, oh, it's just so, so not me. So I've always wanted to re-knit this in another yarn that is more to my taste. And once I got the rights back, I wrote to Malabrigo and they kindly sent me, you know, enough of their sock weight yarn to do the body. Uh, this is their, um, 
Oh, shoot. Well, it's sock, and it is in nope, Stone Chat is the bulky. Oh, poop. I can't find it. But it's a, a lovely clay color. And um, and then also sent me Stone Chat for the the belt and the and the collar and so on. Um, so it's the their chunky yarn in the Stone Chat colorway. Okay, so I got the rights back to this sweater, and you know again wanted to knit it up in my own um, my own color color choosing. And um, got this yarn, and it's lovely, and I've been, you know, knitted up. I've knit the body. So here's, here's the body. It's all knit. I just need to tuck in the ends and sew the shoulders together. Um, I've got the sleeves done. I've knit most of the belt. Uh, just need to finish the collar and, and seam it up, and it's done. And I've been trying to figure out, you know, what is it that's just keeping me from from finishing it and I you know what I think it is I think it's just that I'm mad at it um, it's not the yarn's fault it's not the sweater's fault I really like the sweater and I really like the yarn um, I, I was just so mad at the magazine they not because of the yarn choices really but um, they never paid me for the pattern and it just the whole thing was such a nasty business they ended up going bankrupt and it just wasn't a it wasn't a pretty story so um, it just, the whole project just kind of got bad juju on it, you know? So I think though, I mean, this is actually one of the reasons why I thought this podcast would be really good for me. It would force me to get all this stuff out and look at it again. And it would force me to talk to you every couple of weeks and have to have something to show you. <laughs> you, you will keep me accountable. Um, so, you know, it's kind of good to kind of air all this stuff out, get literally get it out of the bags, take a look at it and think, why am I not finishing this again? There is no reason not to finish that. It's a beautiful sweater, beautiful yarn. Um, just get it done. So, yeah, that one's going to stay out. I'm going to finish that one up. Um, yeah, and I think that's, those are sort of the, the main projects that I wanted to show you. I would love to hear from you about, you know, if you've got projects that are guiltily weighing on your mind or that you're thinking about frogging because it's just been years since you worked on them or that you've actually forgotten what you were making. <laughs> I've done that before where, you know, you just, I've just completely forgotten what it was that I was knitting in the first place. And I've even, you know, taken the needles out because I needed them for something else and I can't remember what size I was working on anymore. So embarrassing. So tell, please tell me what you have been working on that either you're perfectly fine with it resting to the side or it's actually kind of weighing on you. I'd like to hear about those things. Um, I'm going to, my technique that video that I'm going to insert here at the end is uh, kind of an, another play on the theme of, of resting singles. I want to show you uh, a kind of tip that I've I'm sure is not unique to me, but I've sort of come to on my own about winding yarn. One of the things that you also may have done, as I did in this case here, is to wind up a skein of yarn thinking that you were going to knit it imminently, and then you didn't. So you've got it sitting in a cake, and uh, because you wound it up either into a ball uh, by hand or wound it up into a cake on a on a on a swift and ball winder and then it just sits for months even years and one of the problems can be that it can um, get stretched out from being wound up into a cake so I want to show you how to uh, avoid that problem how to keep it from getting too stretched out um, so we'll get to that in a minute what I'll say here at the end is a couple of things one of them is totally forgot to mention what I was wearing last time I was wearing a shawl um, if I wear it again I'll talk about it but uh, I want to mention what I'm wearing. This is a hat that uh, that I designed um, using yarn by Alicia Goes Around. Um, it's her DK weight yarn, and um, the the hat is called um, the Caddy Wampus hat. Caddy C A T T Y W A M P U S, and um, and I really like the idea behind this hat. It's basically 
you cast on along, oops, I'm going the wrong direction, along this edge and, um, and work it back and forth. You actually work this hat flat, um, doing short rows so that it, you know, gets shaped up here at the top. And, um, and then knit, you know, doing decrease, uh, decrease down here at the bottom and an increase up here at the top so that the whole thing kind of biases over to the side. And um, you can either do it solid or in a, uh, in a kind of stripe like I've done here. And you can see it kind of, the stripe sort of goes all the way around. Um, so it's a really fun way to use up some, some DK weight or worsted weight yarn. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention here at the end is how you can find me online. Uh, my website is darkmatternits.com. There is a, a group called Dark Matter Knits Fans on Ravelry. You're welcome to come join us. Um, there's been some discussion of the first episode over there. And um, I'm Elizabeth GM on Ravelry. And you can find me as Dark Matter Knits on Twitter. So hope to hear from you. It's, it's interest I'd love to chat with you about your own marinating, spinning, knitting, or crochet, or weaving, whatever fiber projects you've got going on. Um, and until two weeks from now, I will hope you enjoy your own fiber projects. Bye. Hey, you again. Okay, so I'm going to show you, it's somewhat labor intensive, but I'm going to show you my way of winding a cake of yarn so that you don't get the problem of if your cake does end up sitting in your stash for a while, uh, it won't get too stretched out. Okay, so let me show you what I'm talking about. I'm not going to make you watch me wind this entire skein of yarn, but this is a, a skein of Dream and Color Smooshy, and I'm going to use it as my demonstration piece here. Now, as I cut off each of these threads, um, one of the things that you might notice here is that I've got the... I mean, obviously you have to stretch out your skein onto your swift just to give it some, some tension in order to wind it. The problem is that wool has a little bit of grab to it. You know, it's got scales that cling to itself. It's one of the reasons why, uh, why wool felts if you, you know, don't wash it in the, in the right way. So as I'm pulling the, the yarn off of the Swift, um, it can start to stretch out the yarn a little too much. It can actually, you know, kind of pull sort of tightly as I'm, here, I'll get this started. Sorry about my groaning Swift complaints. But even though I'm not really putting any t much tension on this, just the, the very fact of it grabbing on onto itself, not wanting to, to come off the skein really, and, and being tugged onto the ball winder, it's going to make a fairly tight, it's gonna pull the, the strands of the yarn. And if you left it that way for a long time, it might actually pull the yarn out of shape. And then if you knit it up it um, into a swatch and didn't wash it, say, you might get a completely wrong sense of what your actual gauge is. So, um, because, you know, if you, once you wash it, that yarn is going to bounce back into its original shape and, you know, you'll have a completely different gauge. So I'm going to go ahead and wind this up into its original cake and show you what that looks like. And um, so I'll be back in just a minute. Okay, so I finished winding off the yarn and, um, and I want to show you one of the things, one of the ways that you can tell that you're going to need to use this technique to, if you have your own Swift and Ball Winder. One of the ways you're going to tell that you need to, to do this technique that I'm going to show you is when you're pulling it off the Ball Winder, if you can feel it straining to come off, as I can feel right now, and then you see it just kind of go, and just collapse into itself, and you can feel on the outside how tight the, the ball is, um, that it feels like it's straining, you know, sort of like your skin feels in the wintertime when it's too dry. It feels like it's kind of tugging against itself. This, if you leave it to its own devices, and if you leave it sitting for months or years in your stash, it's going to pull, especially if it's a very squishy yarn, like Smooshy is, that's why I picked this yarn. It has a lot of bounce to it. 
um, it's going to stretch the yarn out of shape. And like I said, it's going to give you lying swatches that tell you something completely different about gauge than what you're actually getting. So I'm going to show you what I do in this instance. Um, if you have your own Swift and Ball Winder, this is what I recommend that you do. It's, it's labor intensive, but it's simple. And I think it just, um, it means that you're going to save yourself some crying later. So here, this is all there is to it. I'm just going to rewind it from this first cake. And you can tell I'm actually having a hard time pulling the end out of the center. I'm going to pull, I'm pulling from the center of this center pull ball right here. I'm not going to pull from the outside. I suppose you could pull from the outside, but this is going to keep it from getting all twisted up and wobbling around. And I just put this down on the floor and wind from there. Now, if you're having this wound at a yard shop, they're probably not going to do this for you. Um, you'll have to take it home and ball it up yourself. Uh, so really the two solutions are, if you have your own Swift and Ball Winder, wind it twice, and I'm gonna show you the effect that it has. Um, or if you are taking it home, just wind it by hand. Um, because that's going to be, if you don't have your own Swift and Ball Winder, just wind it by hand, because you're going to end up with a a looser caked ball, or just knit with it immediately. Now I'm going to, just so you have a sense of scale, for for this. I'm going to show you. This is about what? About three and a half inches across in uh, in diameter. All right, so let's let's take a look at what happens when we, we rewind it, and I will be back in a minute to show you. Well, actually, let me get it started and just show you what I'm talking about. Okay, so I'm just going to take this cake, either you know, just set it here on the table next to me, or actually, I like to put it on here on the floor, so you're not going to be able to see it down there, and then just rewind it onto the ball winder. And sometimes that initial, uh, those initial few yards are really tight in there. So I actually like to kind of pull them out a little bit first like this and then wind them so I don't replicate that super tight stuff at the beginning. And you'll know when it's time to stop, it won't feel like you're having to, to strain to get it to come out. This actually, because this is so smooshy, this wound really tightly. And the reason why it does that, right, is because there's so much give this way in the yarn, that's what makes it so smooshy, that it's like a rubber band. You know, it's just kind of stretching all out of shape and turning itself into sort of like a rubber band ball as you're winding it. All right, so now I've gotten to the point where I can wind from this without the yarn really pulling on itself. So I'm going to finish winding up this ball again, and then I'll come back and show you what a difference it makes in terms of how stretched that yarn is and how big the ball is. Okay, so I finished winding this a second time, and you may actually be able to tell just from looking at it, that this, this ball is actually quite a bit bigger and plumper than the one that I originally wound. And the reason for that was that it's less of a strain for the yarn doesn't have to pull as much when it's coming out of this center pull ball as it does when it's coming off the swift. And just to prove this to you, so if you remember our original ball was three and a half inches wide. Um, this one, this one is almost four and a quarter. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, this is mirrored so it's hard for me to Get this right, but yeah, it's almost four and a quarter. It is four and a quarter inches across. And what you can't feel is that you know when I squish this, it's no longer this hard, you know, compact little mass, but it's actually got some smoosh to it. And so that means that it's the the yarn is closer to a resting state um, as it is in the skein than it is in you know one of those tight little balls. So um, so it's a better if this does end up resting in your stash for a while, this will give you a, knitting from this will give you a truer gauge than if you knit from something that was wound really tightly. 
Now, if you are winding by hand, you may know this already, but um, one of the, the one of the best ways to to do this by hand is to, as you're kind of, you know, starting to wind it around your fingers, try to keep things as loose as possible. Resist the impulse to to pull tightly. And I just kind of turn this to the side and constantly see how I'm wrapping around my fingers. If you constantly keep two, at least two fingers as a kind of buffer between the yarn and that you're winding and the existing ball, that will allow, again, the, the yarn to kind of relax and not be, not be pulled too tightly as it's wound. So I just kind of keep turning it a little bit and winding it with two fingers in between to keep it from stretching out too much. So that's how you can do it by hand in a way that won't, won't get it too stretched. All right, I'll see you next time.